Uh, I'm going to talk to you about brokenness. It's not the greatest subject in the world, but I believe it's a word for his church. Hallelujah. And I know this to be a people that want to hear the word of the Lord. Um, and I could preach about a hundred different things, but I want to preach his word. And I want the rhema word of God. I want the word right now, what God is saying to his people and to fathers and, and, and the, the, the wives and the families of this community. And I pray this word transforms your life. I really do. I've been praying and believing for a move of God through this particular word that he gave me for the churches that he's sending me to. Um, but if you're in Psalm 51, let me give you a little bit of context. I feel like context is so important to understand before we land the plane in Psalm 51. What's going on with David? So in this passage, we're given this very sensitive and vulnerable look into a rather broken time in King David's life. He's putting pen to paper here and bearing his heart to God in what sounds like this desperate plea for forgiveness and this humility as to who God is and who King David isn't. You see, King David has fallen. He's committed adultery and murder. And Nathan, the prophet of God, has come to expose him and remind him that God sees everything. Amen? Being as close to God as David was, how could it be that He would think that God would maybe turn his head from this sin or this time of disobedience in his life. Could it be that after all the years of hiding from King Saul, that maybe David had grown accustomed to hiding himself and thinking maybe God wouldn't see him? Nevertheless, we read this passage, and if you're like me, I love kind of visualizing things. I'm a visionary, and I love kind of putting myself in certain circumstances and situations out ahead and kind of thinking through that process. And I believe if we can kind of go there a little bit about this context of Scripture, we can really start to feel and really start to see into the life of David through his words, this real brokenness in the life of a man after God's own heart. Because that's who David is and was, right? He was a a man after God's own heart. I don't see any other title in the Old Testament for an individual. Hallelujah. We're talking about a significant man here. And although this sounds like this could be and maybe should be the end of his story in the beginning reign of a new king of Israel, it's not. But why is that? Why can, why can a man commit such an act of, of sin and disobedience, but yet God still use him? Why didn't the Lord rip the very kingdom out of his hand that moment, as he did with many other kings in the Old Testament? Could this psalm give us some insight as a people of God, as Children of God as a nation after God. Could this give us some insight on how God deals with us based on our response to sin or disobedience or pains and traumas and troubles that this life brings? Could we possibly mine out some gold in the pain of this man's sorrow and see that in the midst of his brokenness, God can and God will still use him and still use us, his church in America, for his glory? Because I don't believe he's done yet. And I believe there's enough people that can have a heart response that God turns some things around. Hallelujah. Maybe you don't want things to turn around, but I believe I just heard enough amens that God can turn it around. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. This is the first response we see after the confrontation with the prophet. He comes right out the gate. Have mercy on me, O God, (laughs) according according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Boy, he's buttering God up, isn't he? I've been here before with God and with mom and dad. (laughs) I've cried out many times to my old man, have mercy, (laughs) have mercy. (laughs) Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He's, he's kind of realizing here, I know I haven't really hidden from you. I know you see me. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I mean, he is really laying it down right here. He's like, God, I was a baby and I was sinful. Like, you, you saw me in that moment. So vulnerable, but yet sinful, God, have mercy. Oh, but yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. 
You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Verse 7, cleanse me with hospice and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. <laughs> that would have been my cry. <laughs> God, I don't perk my ears up. I need a little bit of joy and gladness in this season of my life. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Verse 10, he really starts to turn things around. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He realized he was broken at this point. You don't cry out for renewal unless you realize you're broken. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Man, this is terminology in Old Testament. We didn't hear much. David being one of the few men that we can really give an account to that the Spirit of God rested and stayed on him. He realized that that was a significant difference in his life. And he's saying, oh, don't take that presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Listen to verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. He knew the consequences of his behavior, and he knew he was seasoned enough to know enough about Jehovah that God could finish him at this moment. But deliver me, God, of bloodshed, you who are God and my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness, and open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. In verse 16 and 17, I really feel like this is such an impacting moment of his desperate plea of help that I think is maybe the reason that God decided to restore him and keep his hand upon him. You do not delight in sacrifice, so I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. You bet your bottom dollar King David would bring a sacrifice. What in a ram safe around him? He would shed blood at any given thing. He was an extravagant worshiper with extravagant sacrifice. But yet he knew something that a lot of others didn't know at the time. That God was after so much more than the sacrifice of an animal. Verse 17, my sacrifice, God. Listen to him. The man that had extravagantly sacrificed for many, many years and burnt offerings and religious behavior and traditions upon traditions and establishment upon establishment. He built so much and done so much, but here he is in the last verse of this cry. He says, my sacrifice, so God, is a broken spirit. I'm broken, God. And I'm broken and I have a contrite heart. It means that my heart is full of sorrow and full of humility, God, and you, God, you will not despise this life and this heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, seal this word in this place. Let it become more alive in our hearts and in our lives. I believe it can transform lives, families, and communities today. In Jesus' name, And the church said amen. amen. I think it becomes clear here that King David's response gives us this insight as to why God restored David. And why God can dis- restore us. And why God can restore a nation. And if you don't amen to me, I will call Hans and I will get all y'all in trouble. I watch this church all the way across the world. I know y'all amen. I hear y'all. I think it becomes clear here that King David's response gives us this insight as to how and why God restored David and really restored a nation. The nation went as the king went a lot of times. And he allowed him to continue with his assignment and walk in his calling. You know, it's after reading this passage that I can really begin to understand the scriptures that declare, he gives grace to the humble. And that if we humble ourselves, which is a big difference, right? Anybody ever been humbled by God in here? Y'all a bunch of troublemakers, ain't y'all? First service ain't soul raised their hand. Anybody here is like happy. I'm like, yeah, God's humbled me. 
There's a big difference in you humbling yourself and God humbling you. If we will humble ourselves, he will lift us up. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. He won't let you stay down in the miry clay. He will exalt you in due season. What's that mean? Exactly what it says. He'll promote you, lift you up, put you on uh, in a place of influence and give you a ministry and bless your family and let the favor of God rest on you. Huh? Anybody want some of that? I need some of that. But I want to propose that I believe the answer to brokenness or the broken seasons of this life, the life that we live, seasons of pain and trauma and grief and uncertainties, even sin and disobedience, I believe that Humility and brokenness can and should walk hand in hand together. You know, I've walked with the Lord now for over 15 years, and I've experienced brokenness in different seasons of my time with Him. And really, the last four years overseas in the country that we live in, it's really a post-COVID world, have only brought me to a place where I'm beginning to realize how broken we all really are and how we all so desperately need Jesus. <laughs> And if you haven't figured it out by now, let me be the first to introduce you to a very fragile world that will teeter-totter at the very tip of anything that throws it into an imbalance. And if there's one thing that's stable, I'm here to tell you it's still Jesus. It's his church that the world should be looking to and say, how, why, I don't understand. Being transparent this morning, it took me a couple years in overseas to start to realize I'm really going to need to humble myself and humble myself quickly. And a lot of you in this room have been there with me and walked those streets and you realize the amount of brokenness there and, and what you experience and what you go through and how it pulls on you and mines out certain things in your life that you thought you had long ago buried. And can I tell you that there's this place the Lord will take you in this life if you allow him. Where you realize you will not and you cannot make it without him. It's beautiful but yet terrifying at the same time. Because the truth is it's not easy being vulnerable and broken even before God and people. We've left little room in our culture for brokenness. For meekness in men. To cry and to be vulnerable and to talk about our problems and... We tend to think that we can still ourselves as a church, as a nation, hide from God. I'm reminded the first thing that Adam did when the realization of his sin was go in hiding. You know, David was on the rooftop during a season of war during this time in his life. You know, it's extremely important to be in the right place in the right seasons in this life as a Christian. You know, there's speculation about this passage and there's a lot of commentary out there and as I've studied it and unpacked it and begin to get an understanding, there was a little bit of unity on this one thing and that was this, that in this season something was wrong with King David. Potentially he was just broken. He was desperate, he was depressed, he was vulnerable, he was complacent, he had insecurities, he had possible signs of being just not himself. And he could not go out to war and lead a nation. And he could not represent himself before his men as this warrior. And so he stayed behind. You know, God gave me this scripture as soon as I really put my feet on the dry land and where we now live. And I got my family situated and he spoke to me one night it says, Zechariah 4, 6, for it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. And man, I really wish I had enough sense in that moment to just realize what God was saying to me. And what I was fixing to go through, endure. I feel confident to share with you this morning, I've definitely experienced brokenness in this life. 
But I can stand here and I can tell you that in the brokenness and the despair and the uncertainties that this life will bring, because it will rain on the just and the unjust. And if you don't think you're going to go through some things, you just keep on living. But I can stand here and I can tell you that in the brokenness and the despair and the uncertainties of this life, that the times I've chosen to humble myself, to yield to a heart of humility, to put my life and my heart in a posture of prayer and repentance and sackcloth and ashes and get before the God of the universe and say, God, I, I realize who you are and I realize who I'm not. To get low and to stay low with a desperate plea of help, God. There's always an outstretched arm, and his name is Jesus. He is the God that never leaves nor forsakes his children. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, closer than the air that we breathe. He's there. When he said, I'm Emmanuel, I'm God with you, he meant it. He chose to embody himself inside of you, to live in you and through you. For whose will? His will. For what purpose? His. If anything happens in this room this morning, may someone die to yourself. In order that you may begin to really live. And I feel like someone needs to hear this this morning. God uses broken feet people. He uses broken marriages. He uses broken homes. He uses broken hearts. He is near to the brokenhearted. He does not despise your brokenness. He can use it. It's in your weakness he's made strong. I know that we want to read that differently. We want to read it like it's in my great personality that God can really use me. It's in my charismatic attitude and my ability to just be so smart that God can really put his anointing on my life. Oh, my name, that great pedigree that's been passed down, that's where God can show himself. He doesn't say it. And I don't know why, but his ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. But in the weakest moments of your life, God shows himself to you. Because he won't share his glory with any other. And if it were not for the Lord, if he didn't show up, if he didn't touch your marriage, touch your life, and save your children, come on, somebody. He's going to get the glory. He's going to be the one that your lips testify of. That when you go to praise him, you'll say, if it were not for the Lord. For it's not by might, nor by any power that you can muster up. It's always by his spirit. You're here today, alive today, living with a purpose today because of him. Don't you forget it. Don't you let go of that. Keep that hunger and that desperate and humility in your lives. If it's anything we need as a people of this great nation a dose of humility and please drink it yourself because when mom and daddy come around make you drink that cough medicine (laughs) boy I think it's a hilarious thing when my wife has to give mercy some cough medicine (laughs) you ain't never seen a kid with gag refluxes like that (laughs) it is coming up and out I promise you that Everybody know you testify right now with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll be like, God, I'll take that bottle. (laughs) I will do it myself. I will humble myself. I realize who you are and who I'm not. I'm so glad that it's in my weakness he's made strong. I'm so glad that I don't, I don't have to do it and chase his strength anymore. The lessons that I've learned and the road that I've had to walk. And he's been 
no different than you in, in this room. Life is hard. Ain't nothing easy about it. I want to give you some practical but really profound stories of found in God's Word. Stories that I pray would give you hope and encouragement this morning. Because, man, we need that. It's okay to say we're discouraged. I'm going to talk to this side over here. All y'all encouraged. All right? I got some biker friends. Y'all don't know how much kinder spirit we are, but y'all my people, okay? <laughs> it's okay to be discouraged. It's okay to lift our hands up and be like, man, I feel like we in the 12th round and we got two black guys, but man, we still in the fight. And the last I checked, I read the end, and it said we win. And I don't know about you, but I got just a little bit more fight in me today. Fight for what? Fight for humility. Fight to realize that who I'm not and who God is. Fight to posture myself, and it takes a, a real man to get on his knees and to fall on his face and to cry out before his children and let his wife hear, God, I can't do it. And I refuse to lead without you. And I refuse to go without you, God. I know I scared my wife and many a times upstairs praying overseas. <laughs> and through those thin walls, she hear me and be like, oh no. Come down and be like, everything okay? And I said, now it is. You know. I want to utilize the time I got left to give you something to chew on for the week, if that's okay. Do a little Pastor Hans on you, preach, stomp, get you fired up, and then be like, all right, y'all sit down, we'll teach a little bit. I'm a lot like him more than I ever thought now watching him for so many years he's as good as it gets he's a good one. I talk to my people you know what I mean I know who y'all are y'all country jokers <laughs> here are three common identifiers of what brokenness kind of looks like in our lives and how to be okay with it how to let God move in it the first one is pruning. Brokenness a lot of times is associated with pruning. Brokenness feels like pruning or cutting away. Brother Jim, you want to be my volunteer? Come on up here, brother. <laughs> Come on up here. Me and you worked this church ground long enough to be able to handle this tree right here, all right? And John, you can just stand right there and look handsome. It ain't hard, all right? In John 15, we all know this passage. I would love to read through it, but if you're taking notes, it's verses 1 all the way through verse 8. In nine different times, this passage, Jesus tells us to remain in him. You know, I snipped this branch this morning over there in Weeksville. God bless Weeksville. All right. If it weren't for Weeksville and the Meads, what, none of us would be here. All right. You know, <laughs> it's the truth, ain't it? I feel like I need to. Thank the founder of the Meads family for all he's done for me. <laughs> but in John 15, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I never, you know, live my life just thinking about God the gardener, okay? I think about God the provider. I love that God. Amen. I <laughs> love it. I think about God the protector, and I've called upon him a time or two in my life. But God the gardener. You see, God looks at us as this tree that he wants to bear fruit. And he wants it to bear a specific kind of fruit, a fruit of his spirit. Because he wants the world to come and taste and see that he is good. Amen? And what he won't have in his children's life is a bunch of low-hanging, rotten fruit. Is anybody? Well, God. And I know that we don't want God the gardener to show up in our lives, but he will. But if this tree could talk, 
And don't you sound bite me and be, have me on the internet saying trees talk now, all right? I know how the world is. They'd be like, that guy's messed up. He said, trees talk. If this tree could talk, I imagine the conversation with God go a little something like this. God, I really appreciate the water. I really do, the water. <laughs> if it were not for that water, God, mm, quenches. I needed it. God, I, I really, I love the seasons where you bring that fertilizer around and you till the soil. And man, I, I know I'm going to bear fruit, God, because of the way that you're tending to me and how much you care for me. But what you got in your hand right now? What is that, God? Brother Jim, can you? I'd hate to cut your finger off, okay, because I know you need your hands. You're a working man, all right? <laughs> Thank you, sir. We don't want this sermon to go another illustration, and I'd, I'd, I would recreate some other sermon. I'd be like, you see that finger right there? <laughs> Same kind of sacrifice God went through. <laughs> we cut me acting a fool now, ain't we, boy? None of us, if you be honest, want God to get these out. Because God says, you know, I, I love you, but I can't have all that bitterness in your life. You ain't going to go too far with it. I love you. I love you, Jimmy, but your heart's broken and I want to heal it. I love you, and I can't have unforgiveness there. I, I love you, and I love people, and I love this community, and, I, and this low-hanging fruit right here that's got a little bit of rottenness. This, this, uh, this racism's got to go. I love you, my child. But what you went through, that pain and that trauma, I'm healing you of it. You're going to bear fruit, I promise you. Just hold on. It hurts. I know it hurts. Ain't nothing fun about amputation. You will remember like the, like the pains of someone who gets their legs cut off or their arm cut off, and they feel the shadow pains of what once was that's not there anymore, but they got it right here. I'm going to heal that. I'm going to heal it. You're going to bear fruit for my kingdom, for my glory. And I'm going to get the glory for what this tree looks Amen. like in the end days. Hallelujah. Y'all give Jimmy a round of applause. You know how hard that was for him? He don't like attention. All right. You know, remain means don't uproot yourself. To remain is a faith response in our lives. Remaining in a situation in order to grow is the abiding. Now, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but that deserved an amen right there. I, you know how hard I thought about that comment? I'm going to say it again because some of y'all are slow, I can tell. To remain is a faith response. We're looking for some big thing God do. God's just saying, remain in the situation where I planted you. You've got to quit transplanting yourself from every church, every job, every marriage that something goes wrong. Listen, I'm telling you what, you transplant yourself, you better realize that transplants don't hardly ever live. It's hard to get that thing to grow and bear fruit. God will transplant you when he's ready. He'll uproot you when he's ready. And I promise you, you will, you will bear fruit one day where you're at and you allow yourself to grow roots. I can't tell you how many times I'd wanted to pack my bags from this church and leave, uproot myself because someone said something to me. Someone looked at me a certain way. Someone said something to my wife. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted in the midnight hour to pack my bags overseas and say, God, I can't do it anymore, and I won't do it anymore, God. And God said, I'm just calling you to remain. I'm asking you to, to dig roots and dig them deep. Don't transplant yourself, Chase. Don't you give up. If you faint not, you'll reap in due season. Amen. It's saying to God, you're here and I'm staying. I can't tell you how many times at 21 years old, I sat there and put my ear up to a door and I heard my wife cry out, God, I'm asking you, hell, let me leave them. God, let me leave. 
him, I'm done. And God speak to her and say, stay, remain, dig roots. I'm going to make him a righteous man. And say, I'm staying. Yes, it hurts. Yes, I don't want to be here. Yes, I'm broken. But I can finally see I don't have the fruit needed for the seasons to come. And I, in humility, am remaining here and choosing to abide. I allow you to take your word like a sword and prune the dead things off of me. So that one day fruit will hang from this tree of life. Oh, what would the tree say if it could cry out? The second thing is molding. I'm sorry, I got a little emotional right there. I, and I, I had something in my eye, like something fell off that tree, hit me right in the eye. Like allergic reaction or something. At least it wasn't the first service. I had one piece of fruit hanging from the tree, and it fell as soon as I went to say something. I was like, my goodness, is my fruit fell? Anybody got a tree in your back pocket with a pear growing on it? And this one didn't have any fruit. I must be back here in the green room. I don't know. Anybody ever bought this stuff right here? Anybody ever bought too much of it? Anybody ever bought it and thought it should last longer? Come on, somebody. Brokenness feels like reshaping and smoothing out the cracks and the breaches of our lives. Brokenness is associated with needing to be repurposed. and We're given the wonderful... Description in Jeremiah 18 is that God's a potter and we're the clay. God's a gardener and God's a potter. And he tells Jeremiah, he said, come down to the potter's house and you are the clay. Put yourself on the potter's wheel. And the beautiful thing about clay, if it will stay in the hand, it will become moldable and usable for a purpose that it's designed By the creator. If I can just keep pressing it. If the clay could cry out, what would it say? It'd say, man, ease up on the pressing, brother. (laughs) Jesus cried the same cry, pressed like an olive in the garden of Gethsemane. God, is there any other plan? Do you got anything else in mind for the clay? Because, man, you are pressing me right now. Pressed him so hard, blood came out of his pores. Like an olive. And as long as the clay stays in the hand, it can be used. The moment you let it out of your hand and it gets into certain circumstances and situation, it does what? It gets hard. And I'm here today to tell you, and I know who you are, but I just don't know who you are. But I know God shared with me, there's going to be people in front of me. You have a hardened heart. One of the most difficult things as a minister that I've dealt with over almost 15 years is coming before someone knowing the change that they need and the words that would bring life to them, but their heart is hardened. And life has seemed to find its way into you that you just have just gotten bitter and aggressive and angry and unforgiven, and you've allowed... You've allowed yourself to stay away from the potter's wheel for too long. The potter has an image in mind. He has a design for your life, whether you think he does or not. And if you will so allow him, he'll put you on the potter's wheel. And with water and a gentle hand, you think I'm rough and you think I'm out of shape and you think I got cracks and breaches that cannot be repaired, but I'm here to tell you. He'll repurpose you. Well, I've been through some things, Chase. He he knows and he sees. And don't think he can't repair. I know I got some hoarders in here. I can see it right now. Some of y'all North Carolinians, Elizabeth City folks. I ain't gonna ask the husbands to raise a hand. Wives, is your husband hoard stuff? He'd just be piling stuff up in the backyard, the garage. He won't let it go. Every time you talk to him or her, they'd be like, I'm going to repurpose that. I see a purpose in it. 
And see, that's how God looks at me and you, Jimmy. Amen. Yeah, something was stolen in the garden that day, and it was his image off the life of Adam. But he said, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to pour out his blood, and I'm going to repurpose them. I'm going to put them back on the potter's wheel. I got an image in mind. Some of us need to get a hold of that today. That you, even though in your brokenness, there is one who sees a purpose. And in your pain, there is purpose. And in the trials and tribulations and the heartache and the sin and the disobedience of your life and your story, the potter is fully capable and able, if you so choose, puts you on the wheel, begin to work you and mold you and change you. Because he never intended for your pot to leak the oil. He never intended for you to live with a crack or a breach all your days. He intended for your cup to overflow. You know, I like those pots that got the three holes on the bottom so the water runs through. But God ain't ever created you that way. He don't want the oil to leak out. He wants it to overflow. But if the pottery could cry out, what would it say? I'm sure the pot would say, I'm fine. The plant's alive, the soil's producing, leave me be. I don't have any cracks or blemishes that I can see. Go check on Brother Ike, he's got some glaring issues. Me and this joker right here. <laughs> it's true, though, right, brother? We do that, right? God, don't worry about me. Uh, go check on so and so. I mean, they leaking oil and leaking fast. Yeah. You ain't checked on their tree lately, Lord? There ain't no fruit. Don't worry about me. I'll tend to myself. Because the truth is, we as a culture and as Americans, we tend to look around at all the broken things around us and refuse to look what's broken inside of us. As men, we typically live our lives with seeing everything that needs to be fixed, but we never sit down and get on our knees and say, God, she ain't pumping right, Lord. And he ain't ticking right, God. And I need help. crazy thing about clay is if it's let in uncertain circumstances, it hardens and it loses the ability to be molded. I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't want to trust anymore. Last time I surrendered something to God, it didn't go the way I thought it should go, and I just can't do it anymore. Go to the potter's wheel. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you were left out too long in a situation. Maybe it was a situation that was out of your control and it was an unhealthy environment over time. You, you allowed the hardened things of this life to just callous your heart and callous your mind and refuse to heal and move on. And maybe you've been left out in general, overlooked, abandoned, helpless in a situation that you couldn't do anything about. I'm here today to tell you that God saw you. He sees you in the pain that you might feel in the midst of your darkest moment. He was there. You still had to endure it. And I understand I don't know it all. I don't get it sometimes. But I've chosen to run to him and not from him. The last thing is breaking. Brokenness seems to feel like everything's falling apart. And it is quiet in this holiness church. Well, ain't nothing ever falling apart in my home, Chase. I know we don't want to talk that way and we don't want to be transparent that way, but half the time we're all falling apart. Mark 14, why Jesus was in Bethany, 
reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman, with an alabaster jar came to his feet. And I'm reminded about this story. And Garner, you can come out, my, my brother, and you can just start playing. And we'll, we'll figure out how God wants to wrap this thing up. And I'm reminded it always starts with Jesus coming into the living room of our heart. It always does. I wish there was some other way I could tell you, but there's not. It's always about this invitation to come and sit and dwell. Let your presence do something in my midst. He never asked her for anything. She just sensed it was time. He never told her, this is what I require of you. She just knew your presence is demanding something. And Jesus does that in different seasons of our life where he shows up uninvited and unannounced and comes in and sits back at the table in the living room of our hearts. And we feel and we sense to bring everything we have to him. The most precious thing that we could absolutely have in our life in that moment. We bring to the feet of Jesus and we break it. And Jesus says, because she did what she did, her story will always be told. In the breaking, your story goes forth. Well, God can't use that part of my story. You bet your bottom dollar he can. He'll do it. Won't he do it? There's enough people in this room that I know. Won't he do it? Well, that was the most difficult season of my life when my alabaster jar got broken. I don't know about you, but this life's so feeble. But if God looked at me and said, that act of faith, I'll tell it for eternity. I'll be like, sign me up. Because people I worked with five years ago don't know my name. And I want to bring you glory, God. I want to be like Noah, a man that was known to walk with God. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Noah's story. What was, who was Noah? A man. God was attributed to Noah's name story of faith because God's looking for what's in the inside brokenness can lead to seeing Jesus for who he really is and not who you think he is the road to Emmaus we find in Luke 24 is this beautiful passage where they're walking with Jesus the resurrected Jesus they have no idea who they're with until they invite him in And say, come and sit at my table and sit in my house. There's something about the presence of God. About a life that says yes to Jesus. That puts a demand on his presence. Consecrated heart and a holy lifestyle. And you say, come dwell with me. A pursuit of your life that says, I want you to dine with me. Sit on me. Rest on me. Be in my home, God. You're welcome in this place. And in the midst of them inviting him in, Jesus breaks the bread. And in the breaking of the bread, they see him for who he really is. Because we see Jesus for who he really is. When we say, come in and break the bread, God. Come in and dwell with me and fellowship with me. And in those moments, those precious moments of our life, we get a glimpse at the Son of God. And it changes everything. Did our hearts not burn within us when he broke the bread? Brokenness, the last thing but the hardest. Brokenness can lead to distribution. The beautiful story of John 6 has been told for so long about the miracle of feeding almost 20,000 people. But I feel like so many times the little lad was left out. Jesus is looking for the little lads of this generation. What does that mean? He's looking for the ones that will bring everything that they have. Where? To his feet. For why? So he can distribute you. For what purpose? Whatever purpose he has in mind. Well, I'm not okay with that. We'll be okay with it. I trust him with my lunch. 
If you can, Jesus can, if I can give him some fish and some bread, I can give him my finances. I can put my children in his hands, my marriage in his hands, my church in his hands, my ministry in his hands. And when everyone else who was supposed to have some fish and bread showed up and they didn't, the Bible says that the little lad was there ready to be used. And guess what? His story made it into the story. And although his mom and daddy probably got home that night at 10 p.m. and they looked for that fish and that bread because they was hungry, and that little boy had a smile on his face and said, let me tell you a little something, something. What Jesus did with that fish and that bread, he'll do it with your life. Because ultimately, you were nothing but bread in his hands. bread in the hands of the Lord for what purpose so he can distribute you why so people can taste and see that he is good so that the world can taste and see that he is good Thank you so much for listening today, watching with us, opening your heart to the Word of God. It's my highest honor to preach the Word. Our church exists to reach people like you. That's why we exist, to be able to communicate the gospel to the entire world. God has given us such an amazing outreach here to be able to do it this way through the internet and stuff. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. So I pray that God has touched you today that God has ministered to you, and I want to pray for you right now. If you need to accept the Lord into your heart, give your life to Jesus, or if you need healing in your body or healing in your mind, I want to pray for you right now. Could you join with me? Come on, just make this declaration. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. I repent of all sin, and I commit my life to you right now in Jesus' name. Come on, if you need healing, stretch out your hand. Father, for those who need a healing touch, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you heal them body and mind and touch them right now. We rebuke the disease and sickness that it's afflicting their body, and I pray for a complete wholeness. Come over them in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him praise right where you are. Thank God for everything He's done in your life. Tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. We love you guys, and it's a privilege to come to you.